Almighty God, as we enter into Holy Week and begin our contemplation of these great mysteries by which you have redeemed the world, we always come to Palm Sunday with a strange mix of emotions, so much joy and um, almost a sense of um, frolic as the children come down the aisle ringing bells and waving fronds and we hear the joy of the shouts of praise, Hosanna in the streets. And yet, Father, because we know this story from our position in time, we look back 2,000 years and remember the suffering and the rejection and the sorrow. We remember that our Savior was marred beyond any human resemblance, bearing the transgressions of us all. And amidst the joy, Lord, we're full of sorrow and tears that salvation had to be so costly for the Lamb of God. So, Lord, in the midst of these strangely mixed emotions, would you prepare us for the mystery of the week, the Paschal mystery that the Lamb that created all things was slain before the foundations of the world and that you did that for us. You did that for your glory, but it is for us salvation beyond any human imagining. Lord, I ask that you would be in all of my words, that they would be pleasing to you. I pray that your spirit would come, fill this place, fill the hearts of your faithful, Make our meditations, our thoughts, our actions pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Lord, this Holy Week, today, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we want to cling to you and see you as our only rock and our only redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So as we <clears throat> begin this Holy Week uh, with this Palm Sunday service, I want to start with a confession, and that is that I am not a perfect husband by any stretch of the imagination. My wife Mimi could give you a laundry list of ways in which I regularly fail, but perhaps my greatest failure is this. I will not, no matter how much Mimi begs me, let a donkey go down that center aisle on Palm Sunday. <laughs> For me, the idea of an animal having an accident right here at the crossing greatly outweighs the cute factor of having a dog or a sheep or a camel or a donkey, whatever animal you want, joining humans in the worship of God that happens in this place week after week. And the Rowells might need some marital counseling over this matter because she asked for a donkey every single year. But I'm going to make a deal publicly right now with my wife, okay? Next year, God willing, and the creek don't rise, we will have a donkey petting area in the garden outside. And so if you're young at heart or young and you want to pet a donkey on Palm Sunday, you could do so before we all come processing in, waving palm fronds and shouting, Hosanna. Is that a deal? Deal. All right. Don't let my wife have the lead of that donkey because she's going to bring it right down that center aisle behind her. Well, all kidding aside, and it is kind of strange to begin Holy Week with such laughter, I suppose, but it is part of the weird mix of emotions that lie ahead of us. I want to say that even if there's no donkey trooping down the aisle today, a donkey is a better sign and signal of Palm Sunday than our palm fronds. So the title of the sermon is, When is a Donkey Better Than a Palm Frond? And the answer is Palm Sunday. And I want to tell you why. In this morning's lesson from the Gospel of Matthew, we see Jesus sending two of his disciples into Bethphage to find animals for the Son of God to ride into Jerusalem. And in traveling on the backs of these two beasts of burden, Jesus makes a profound declaration of the nature of his rule. He reveals himself to be the one bearing humility into the midst of the world. It's a 
profound vision of the humility with which God comes to us in Jesus. In verse 4, Matthew recounts the prophecy from Zechariah 9.9 9, that when the true king comes, when God's mighty Messiah arrives, he will come in not on a mighty war horse, but on a humble donkey. It's worth hearing directly from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Palm Sunday is all about the humility of Jesus and the humility with which we should reflect the goodness of our Savior because he rides in not on a war horse or in a chariot, but upon a beast of burden. His choice of steed reminds us of what all Holy Week points us towards, that he comes to rule, not from a throne, but from a tree. Jesus does bring salvation and righteousness to the world, but he does so not by taking up arms against the sea of earthly troubles that face God's people, but rather by taking up arms against our truest enemies, death and Satan and hell and sin. And God in his humility comes among us in the flesh and he lets those things kill him so that you and I might share in his victory over them. That when he bursts the bonds of death and his mighty resurrection, we too can be there to sing praise to God. And he does all of that for his glory. But he does that also out of love for you and love for me. You know what Hosanna means, right? It means save us. And so we cry, save us to Jesus. And he does. But again, he doesn't save us the way we might have expected. He doesn't save us with military might or political power, but rather his righteousness covers up our unrighteousness. He does so much more for us than we could have asked for or imagined. God so loved the world. God so loved you that he died paying the price for every sin you and I will ever commit, past present, and future. And when he rises again, he brings us with him, for the grave cannot hold those of us in Christ. And for that we say, praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Today's epistle reading reminds us of how the humility of Jesus solves problems for us that we didn't even know that we had. He, he changes our deathly futures into futures full of life, and rejoicing. In Philippians 2, Paul sings his great hymn of praise to God, rejoicing that when God came into the world, he didn't do so as one born in a palace or riding on a mighty stallion. He didn't appear on the clouds and bowl us over with his might and his glory and his power. I might remind us that he has done that plenty of times in human history, and we have quickly forgotten his lordship. It always strikes me as insane that the people of Israel could have seen what God was doing on top of the mount when Moses received the Ten Commandments and still be down there in the valley worshiping a golden calf. And yet they did. The human will to go our own way would not be changed by God's appearance on the clouds. We would find a way unless God changes us inside to go our own way rather than serve him. And so in God's great salvation plan, he comes among us humbly, born in a stable. He gets down into the muck and mire of this broken world with us. It's worth having a donkey around to remind us that God gets real with us. He gets down to where the smelly hay is. He empties himself, Paul tells us. He comes among us as one who wants to serve rather than to be served. And in the ultimate sign of his humble love, he dies on the cross to make reconciliation possible between us sinners 
and a righteous and holy God. In verse 10, Paul reveals the glorious news of how the humility of Jesus restores our fortunes. Jesus was brought to the depth of human sin and loss. As the Apostles' Creed puts it, he went even into hell for you and for me. But the one who went all the way to the bottom of all things has ascended to the heights. He is the one now exalted as the one who is both fully God and fully man. He's at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus left heaven to take on flesh, humbly to walk among us. And yet we confess that he is now ascended to the right hand of the Father, still in the flesh. That man who rode into Jerusalem on a humble donkey to die is now a man glorified in the presence of God. And he invites men and women like you and me to join him there. This gives us the greatest hope that we could imagine. For if we humble ourselves and follow after Jesus' example, we can follow in how he has led the way, all the way to eternal life in the everlasting holy places. So why did I throw palm fronds under the bus earlier? Well, let me put it this way. We can wave palm fronds on Palm Sunday, but we have to wave them for a different reason than the crowds that day. Those crowds outside of Jerusalem long ago waved them for the wrong reasons. We need to wave them for the right reasons, and those right reasons should resound in your heart every time we come to see those children waving palms and we see these beautiful palm fronds adorning our worship each year. The folks lining the road were almost certainly waving them for wrong reasons. Nationalistic hopes for Israel that they would overthrow their oppressors and regain their freedom and their independence. Those, those, those emotions always reached a fever pitch at major feast days like Passover. Just 200 years earlier, a messianic figure named Judas Maccabees had defeated the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes. He purified the temple, and he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a war horse. And what did they do? They waved palm fronds, welcoming this earthly, military, ruling Messiah, who, of course, wasn't what they needed. He died and has been forgotten in the dust of history. And in response to Jesus' arrival, that same buzz goes through the crowd. They've heard about this new Galilean prophets, how he'd healed many and fed 5,000 men, women, and children with a few loaves and fishes. And they thought, maybe now it's time, right? It's happening. Maybe for the last time, we'll finally get a Messiah who will set us on the thrones. We will rule earth forever as God's chosen people. And so as Jesus made his triumphal entry, the nature of his triumph was lost on folks who were thinking more about their nation than about the soul of their nation. The triumph the people were looking for was temporal. They wanted nationalistic victory, not the spiritual victory that they needed. His salvation was deeply different than the one for which they longed. And if the donkey signaled humility, the palm fronds signaled military victory, political victory, a victory that met with man's expectations and not God's ultimate plan for salvation. Because God's triumph would not be limited to just defeating Rome. God's victory was over our greatest enemy, our last enemy, death, and the grave, and Satan, and the forces of hell. Now, even if I delight my wife by having a donkey somewhere around here next year, I promise that I won't, in turn, take palms out of the hands of our little ones. I simply want to remind them and remind myself and remind all of us what we mean when we shout Hosanna. What we mean 
when we wave those palm fronds, when we adorn our church with their beauty, we cannot ask for what those crowds asked for. And it is in our human heart to ask for it. We need to ask for what we're supposed to be asking for. We do not need God to glorify our nation or our party or our candidate. We are not asking God to save us by doubling our bank accounts or allowing our child to get into just the right school or our team to win a championship. Rather, we are asking God to save us the way that only he can by destroying death through humble submission and then teaching us how to live with that same kind of humility. For it is that kind of life, not one puffed up with earthly pride and earthly glory. It's that kind of life, the life of humility that leads to salvation. I want my life and I want your life to be lived astride a donkey and not astride a war horse. Over lunch today, as we prepare ourselves for Holy Week, ask yourself, ask your family, in what ways can we show the world around us that we serve a king who teaches us humble obedience? We serve a king who teaches us humble service. And when we cry, Hosanna, When we wave our palm fronds, we're asking God to save us so that we might be made after his own likeness, not people puffed up with pride, not people afraid of tomorrow that we might somehow lose an earthly battle, but that our eyes are fixed on the king, astride a donkey, going to the cross, and then making us cross bearers into a world that needs to see in us what the crowds saw in the empty tomb just a few days later. So I'm going to end this sermon a little early today, rejoicing, I hear, because at the end of today's worship service, we're going to do something that we've never done before at Christ Church, at least not during my tenure as rector. So let me explain. When you go back to the earliest records of the church and you try to figure out what people used to do on Palm Sunday, the earliest Palm Sunday services literally lasted all day long. You would get up in the morning and you would go up on the Mount of Olives because the church was still based in Jerusalem. And they had a series of services marking the pathway that Jesus would have taken into the city. And late at night when they were done feasting and worshiping all day, they would gather around the empty tomb to worship. And as Christianity spread out from Jerusalem, Palm Sunday worship morphed over time to still have those two phases. One phase, shouting Hosanna and waving palm fronds, maybe even having a donkey around, right? And then there would be a service at the end of the day, remembering the humble death that Christ would die. But over time, they found that people would come to the morning service, and then they wouldn't come to the evening service. And so you can find even in our prayer book, um, today's service is referred to as Palm slash Passion Sunday. It's a service that has that same division. First, the palms, and then a reminder of the reality of the crucifixion. Part of the reason for all of this is that if you only came to Palm Sunday with all of its ironic rejoicing, palm fronds and donkeys and hosannas, and you missed everything that happened between now and next Sunday, you wouldn't really know what all the shouting was about on Easter Sunday morning. Because it's only through the sorrows of Holy Week that the joys of Easter Sunday make any real impact on us. And so today, we're going to restore some of that stark contrast on Palm Sunday. So we'll end this service preparing for the darkness of Holy Week so that the brightness of Easter will be bright indeed. At the close of today's worship, we will read aloud the things that are going to happen on Friday, on Good Friday, when the crowds that cried, Hosanna, cried, crucify him, less than a week later. 
So by all means, let sweet children waving palm fronds and shaking bells fill you with joy and pet the donkey next year. But remember who the king we praise really is. The king who loved us so much that he went to the cross. These palms should teach us like a donkey does how to walk humbly with our God who loves us enough to die for our sins. Amen.